Okay. It completed uh, the course by uh, Hermann Schulz and this is the part two of uh, of the same. The yeah. same. Of the same series of transparency. So good morning, everybody. Um, well, I have the same transparencies. No, so yesterday I spent quite a lot of time explaining the physics and then we started slowly getting into math. Today it's been going to be basically just the math, but let me um, start out with uh, the point where we stopped and uh, I told you, well, all these introduction here about lots of physics, well, not everything, but then we stopped at the end at this uh, SSH model and uh, let's look at that once, once again because we're going to take somehow a math perspective on, on that model in a second. Yeah? What I told you, it's, uh, it's a discrete Schrodinger operator on L2 of Z with fibers which are of dimension 2. So it's a 2 by 2 matrix. And you can write it with the shift operators. And there's a mass term. Here the mass term is constant. Afterwards we had a random mass term. But if it's constant, you can do this Fourier transform. And then there was this winding number thing. And okay. Anyway, this wind non, having a non-trivial winding number implied that if you restrict the operator on a half space, uh, which is denoted by a hat here, by just directly boundary conditions, then automatically that operator has zero mode, okay? That zero mode is in the positive chiral sector, and uh, well, uh, there's no other zero mode, so... Uh, this zero mode, the existence of the zero mode is in this trivial, simple model here, linked uh, to the winding number, they're just equal. Whenever the winding uh, is zero, which happens when the mass here is between minus one and one, then a non-zero winding leads to um, a boundary state. And that was true also in the disordered model, okay? So if you add disorder um, in one way or another, for example, by adding a random mass term, then uh, the same thing remains true, the same fact remains true. You have one bound state and that bound state is equal to a winding number, but the winding number now, of course, cannot be calculated by simple Fourier analysis anymore. You have to go on and calculate it with, well, the, say, non-commutative substitute of that. Instead of deriving derivation, by quasi-momentum, which you can do in Fourier space, you go ahead and take a commutator in quantum mechanics with the position operator. Huh? Go ahead and do the calculation once to compare that. That that's really the same, and then you put in the number which should uh, the operator which should have a winding uh, inside of the formula, formula, the usual formula for the winding number, and then you take the commutator with the, the operator a, multiply by its inverse, and then until, instead of integration over quasi-momentum, we have to here take some kind of a tracial state, and the tracial state here is simply given by taking expectation at, with respect to disorder and taking the matrix element at the origin, okay? I will tell you in which sense that's really a state a little bit later. It's, it's really a tracial state, it's like a trace. You can do all the usual tricks that you're used to doing with, it, with a trace, which is it. In the commutative case, it's the integral over a closed manifold, which is just the circle in this case, okay? Where you also can do integration by parts without boundary terms, okay? Like you can do with a trace. Good, so uh, that was the theorem here. So one thing that I promised you at the end is that, uh, uh, okay, the, the first theorem was this index theorem, which connects this winding number, also called the first churn number, defined on the prior transparency to the index of a Fredholm operator. And apparently you didn't know exactly what this index is, or some of you at least weren't so sure about it. So I, I promised you two or three, uh, or one, actually it's just one transparency about what the index is. And, and Fritz told, told you that he's going to tell you a lot more about that uh, later on in, the, in, in his lecture series. But uh, okay, the index is something that you can already understand somehow in, in linear algebra. So let's start with that. In linear algebra for a matrix T, which is not square, um, so it's uh, N by M matrix, you have uh, the rank theorem, which tells you that the rank of, uh, uh, well, that, that M, the number which is the image, the, the how you say, the this base that you start out with, okay, can be calculated the number as the dimension of the kernel plus the dimension of the range of the matrix, okay? And that's something that you learn in linear algebra one of the first classes. 
And uh, well, let's, the other thing that you learn is that the range is nothing but the orthogonal complement to the kernel of the adjoint of the matrix. Okay? Also a fact which is true without the dimension in, uh, before. And if you have an orthogonal complement, well, the orthogonal complement of any subspace can be calculated as the dimension of the space, well, minus the dimension of the space time uh, plus the dimension of the total space. Uh, so this is simply the total space, which is the n-dimensional space and with the kernel of T stars embedded, minus the dimension of the co-kernel itself. Okay? So you get this simple identity, and we're going to rewrite it, namely you just uh, subtract the n, put it on the other side, and you see that m minus n is the dimension of the kernel minus the dimension of the co-kernel. Obviously, that means, because m and n are fixed, that means that, the, I mean by the matrix size, that means that the difference between the kernel and the co-kernel is extremely robust. It is stable, it's an invariant, one says it's an homotopy invariant, because, you see, you can change the matrix inside of the space of matrices of this size, which may very well change the kernel, but if it changes the kernel, the co-kernel has to change at the same time in such a way that this difference is really constant, I mean, it's, it's really the same always, okay? And therefore, that number, this difference of these dimensions is, is interesting, even in the matrix case. There, it's a bit trivial, yeah, but... Uh, it's a fact that this difference is, is homotopically stable under deformations of the um, matrix, okay? So that's what I wrote down here. So for quadratic matrices, that thing is not very interesting because, well, if m and n are equal, then the difference is always equal to zero. Uh, so it just gives you a connection between dimension of the kernel and dimension of the co-kernel. But in infinite dimensions, it's very well possible if you have, so to say, the in in infinite square, infin infinite dimensional square matrix, so it goes, say, from one Hilbert space of infinite dimension into another Hilbert space of infinite dimension, it's very well possible that this number uh, is non-zero, okay? Of course, in order to be able to calculate that number, you first have to know that these dimensions are even uh, something that you can calculate, okay? So what one says is, I look at a class of linear operators which have the property that the kernel and the co-kernel are finite dimensional, okay? It's a natural thing to look at, and if you do that, you can define this difference and you can define the index. And the nice thing is that this is, this is a good concept that is the se second and the only second transparency that I have on, on the FATOM index because it's the, the only thing that we use, actually, later on. Uh, well, you say an operator is called a Fredholm operator on the Hilbert space, yeah? If it has finite dimensional kernel and finite dimensional co-kernel. Usually one adds this, that the range is closed. You don't really need that. You can also prove that that's true then if the other two things are hold. Um, and uh, if... If, if these two are finite, well, you can define the index. And indeed, this index has the same properties as we had for matrices. It, namely, if I look at a path, a homotopic deformation of my linear operator, which is indicated here by an index T there, yeah? Index T, well, then uh, this index doesn't change. Okay, before it was n minus n, now it's some number, and this number can actually be any kind of a number, an integer number, of course, okay? The second important property of the index, that it's, it's stable. Under comfort perturbations, namely you can add to uh, the operator, the Fredholm operator, a compact operator, and it doesn't change the index. So what is a compact operator? Hopefully most of you know yeah, from some kind of fun basic functional analysis class, but if you don't know, you can just think of adding a matrix. Yeah? Uh, for example, adding a, a matrix, meaning a finite rank operator, is definitely a compact perturbation. And compact computations in general is just that you take limits of matrices, okay, which can become bigger and bigger and bigger, but this limit should converge in the operator norm topology. Huh? So the norm topology that you have on the class of operators, okay? Yes? Quick warning. If the operator is unbounded, you do need the range 
That's correct. That's correct. But I'm very limited here. I use only bounded operator. But you're right. Otherwise, you have to pay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Obvious. Otherwise, you do need it. Yes. Okay. So uh, here's the example, which actually will be also relevant for our example in just a second when we go back to the physics model uh, of an operator which has a non-trivial um, index. Uh, so I want a Hilbert space. The Hilbert space is the simplest one. It's the L2 of n space, yeah, of, of square summable sequences. And uh, the operator that we look at is just the shift. It shifts everything to the left, OK? So you take your sequence of numbers and you shift it to the, well, uh, depending on how you draw that, yeah, you shift it, you shift it to the left. And uh, as I already told you yesterday, well, we, we will denote this unilateral shift, it's called. So you start here from 0, 1, 2, 3, and you shift everything. Well, something happens to this thing. This guy is moved out, OK? So this thing has a kernel, the shift. We used that already yesterday, yeah? And uh, therefore, the, the kernel is non-trivial. It has the vector 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, OK? And uh, well, the co-kernel is the right shift. It has no, it ha the, the co, the, co um, the adjoint operator, OK? Um, is the right shift, and I did forget to put a star here. I do see, okay, there should be a star there. It has no kernel, yeah? and therefore, well, the two dimensions, first of all, they are finite. One is one and one is zero, and the difference is non-trivial, it's one, okay? So that's, uh, that's a, an example of an operator which has a non-trivial kernel. It's actually the canonical example. You can show that any other example can be written with index one can be written in this form if you choose an adequate basis, okay? And an index theorem, what is an index theorem? Well, uh, an index theorem is a theorem which connects uh, an index of some kind of a Fredholm operator to something interesting of topological nature like the winding number. So the index theorem that I had on the other transparency connected the winding number to the index of precisely the shift operator or variance of it, okay? Okay, so much on the Fritholm index. So let's go on a little bit about uh, explaining something even more interesting on this SSH model, namely um, how this boundary correspondence can be understood in a more conceptual way. I showed you that these boundary states really exist by very simple cal calculation, but now I want to show you that there's a structure, mathematical structure behind it, which is going to survive to higher dimensions, okay? And uh, that's linked to what is called the triplets extension. Um, I mean, what are the objects that we had? We better basically just had the shift operator, and we which acts on L2 of Z, and then we had uh, the unilateral shift, which acts on L2 of N. These were the basic objects which were in there. We built matrices out of that, yeah? So um, you can use a C-star algebra, which you build out of the uh, shift operator. So what means that? Well, you take the shift operator, you take polynomials in the shift operator, and you close with respect to the norm topology. Then you get a C-star algebra, by Fourier transform, this C-star algebra is very simple. It's just given by the continuous functions on the circle, okay? So the, basically the shift, the bilateral shift is inside of the C-star algebras of the continuous functions on the circle, which you know very well, okay? The unilateral shift, I can do the same thing. You construct all polynomials in the shift and you close with respect to the operator norm. You obtain some kind of a C-star algebra, an algebra which is closed under the norm topology. And uh, that algebra is called the triplets algebra, okay? And that triplets algebra is a bit more complicated. Why? Because this unilateral shift had this property if I, well, here I wrote the wrong way around it with the star properly. If you first shift, if you first shift to the right, and then back to the left, you get the identity. But if you first shift to the left, and then you shift back, so I have it the other way around here, then with this, the star should be uh, over there. If you, if, and here it should be here. Um, if you first shift to the left and then to the right, you don't get quite the end identity, but you get a defect, and the defect is the projection onto this side. Yeah? 
So here there's a projection, and I write the projection in the physicist, the physicist notation in that way, okay? On the state at the origin. So what does that mean? That means that this finite dimensional matrix must be in this C star algebra generated by the shift, the unilateral shift. And I can shift that. If now I go ahead and I put this unilateral shift here to the right, say I shift it here uh, to the right, to the right, n times, and I shift it to the left, n times, what do I get? Well, I get the state, uh, the, the one, rank one operator, which goes from site n to site m, okay? So basically, I can generate any kind of a matrix with that. So all matrices, finite rank matrices must be in this algebra. And because it's a C-star algebra, that means that also all compact operators must be in that algebra. Okay, there's a subset of that algebra. Um, and therefore, well, let me call this algebra of the unilateral shift, the triplets algebra, yeah? It contains, as a subset, the compact operators, denote by K. And on the other hand side, from any kind of an operator in the triplets algebra, I can throw away the hats, which means simply that I uh, throw away all compact terms. If I throw away the hats, that means that I take my operator and I shift it all the way to the right. That's another way to say it. I move it to plus infinity in such a way that only the periodic terms remain and all the compact things are discarded, okay? And therefore, one gets, one gets what one call an, an exact sequence of C star algebras, okay? I have this triplets algebra inside the compact operators and it's projected down by moving it all the way to the right to the periodic operators. And the periodic operators is with just C of S1, continuous functions on the circle, okay? Good, so, and what means exactness of such a sequence? Well, exactness, means that the image of I, I is this inclusion there, yeah, is precisely equal to the kernel of pi, which is the projection. And yet, that you see is true, okay? That is a property that is true. And you make it, uh, well, a short exact sequence by including zero to the left and to the right, trivial algebras, okay? So, uh, why is that interesting, this structure behind it? Because uh, associated to an exact sequence of C-star algebras, you always have um, an associated interesting sequence of K-theory. So basically, my lecture today will be about explaining what K-theory is and what this exact sequence is. So I'm going to be short now, but I give you more and more and more details during the lecture today. But to have a first uh, idea, you could think of K-theory as something which associates to um, an operator algebra, the set of classes of projections in that algebra. So that's the first object that you get, K0, is the classes of projections in the algebra. So if I say classes, Classes, you, I, I, I mean homotopy classes. So you were, will identify one projection with another projection if I connect, can connect them with this path, okay? So if in three-dimensional space you have one projection, one dimension pointing in that direction, yeah, and another one there, I can deform them by just rotating, okay? So the, the, this pi is a C-star algebra morphism? Yes, they are all C-star algebra morphisms, exactly. Yes, right? they conserve the algebraic structure and uh, they conserve the star uh, and their linear maps. Okay, so, so K0 is basically classes of projections, homotopy classes of projections. Now you see there's also a minus sign. Actually what one wants is one wants to build a group. So projections you can add you have two projections, you can turn them into two orthogonal projections and then you can add the two projections, okay? So I can add projections, at least homotopy classes of projections, but I can't really take differences very well and therefore one does take formal differences, okay? And therefore there's a minus sign here. Like you, when you go from the uh, natural numbers 
to the integer numbers, well, you have to do something. You add a minus sign, okay? <laughs> and that's, that's basically what you do there. So K0 is the classes of projections. And then there's a second group in the game. I told you now already it is a group. We'll see that in a second in more detail. The second class of interesting operators in an algebra is the class of unitary operators. So for unitaries, you do the same thing. I mean, unitaries, you can think of just something like rotations, okay? And you can identify rotations if you can move them homotopically one into another. That's what we do. So you get classes of unitaries. And classes of unitaries, well, actually not only in V-algebra, but also in matrix algebras over the algebra, can be made into a group, which is the group K1. And I'll tell you more about that. Okay, so uh, here's two examples. Uh, for the complex number, what is the K0 group? Well, the K0 group is the integer numbers because uh, what I didn't tell you, unfortunately, is that you don't look only at projections in the algebra, but you look at projections in matrix algebras over the algebra. So if you just think of matrices, well, there are various projections, but it's definitely not possible to deform a projection of rank one into a projection of rank two, okay? So they must be different classes. On the other hand side, for matrix, any, any uh, projection of rank one, okay, can be deformed in any other projection of rank one. Yeah? You just have to find the right rotation into, which moves in, in, into it, each other, okay? However, the dimension is an invariant of the projection, which I can't change by homotopy, okay? Therefore, if you go to bigger and bigger matrices, uh, any kind of a dimension can appear, yeah? Now, you would say, well, dimension is always positive. That's correct. Therefore, you would get a semi-group of positive integer numbers, yeah? But in the K group, you do what one calls Groten deconstruction. You do add formal negative, formal differences, and then you get from the integer, the, uh, the, you get from the natural numbers, the integer numbers, okay? Good, so that's the first uh, example of an K group. Uh, actually, it's also the K group of the compact operators, okay? That's already a bit of fact that you have to prove that uh, K theory is something which is stable under compact operators. Well, it's by construction stable under going over to matrices because I allow myself to go over to matrices anyway. Yeah? Going to compact operator just pushes that to the limit in some sense. Okay? Okay. So let's give an example of K1. Well, uh, one algebra which we did study was the continuous functions on the circle. What does it mean now to be for such a function to represent a class in K1? Well, it should be unitary. So unitary means that the function is from the circle into the circle itself or into the unitary matrices in more general, okay? So if you have a function from the circle into the circle, it's in particular invertible, so it has a winding number. And two functions which have different winding numbers, they're really different. I can't deform them into another one, okay? So therefore, I have different classes of unitary operators in C of S1. And they are labeled by what one calls an invariant, which is just the winding number, which we, you know well. Okay? Good. So these are two examples. These are the two main examples, actually, that uh, we work with. So let's go how we use this stuff. Okay. So, um, well, associated to the c star algebra exact sequence, there's always an exact sequence in K-theory, which I'll try to explain to you in detail now, which connects the six groups which are evolved. Why six groups? Well, because we had in the exact sequence of C-star algebras, which in our case was just uh, C of S1, yeah? uh, the triplets algebra and the compact operators. To each one of those, you have two groups now, the K0 and the K1. Two times three is six, so we have these six groups there. Yeah? And what makes K-theory interesting is that these six groups can be put into a diagram of six abelian groups, and this diagram is exact. That means that 
I have some maps here, and at each point, for example, this point, the range of this guy here, uh, sorry, the kernel of this map here is exactly, um, no, sorry, the range of this guy here is exactly the kernel of that one, okay? The exactness condition that we had down here as well, okay? You have it now, not for algebra, so here the maps, the connect, all these maps which are here, they are now algebraic maps, okay, between abelian groups in this case, but it's a really deep fact that I want to explain to you that this is a commutative diagram, okay? So there are some of these maps which are really easy. There's this push forwards maps, one says. You see, if I have, for example, here a projection here in this group on the left here, because this projection, uh, if it sits in here, say, yeah, I can move it over there because I have the inclusion map. So you get a new projection, which is still a projection lying in here. Therefore, if I look at the classes, well, I get a new class over in the next algebra, over here to the right, yeah? And this new class is just called the push forward, I lower star of the class that I had before. So there's a very natural map which allows you to include projections, move projections from here to projections here and here as well with the map pi. And on the other side below here, it goes the other way around, but you see I put the k once here and once there, and this algebra is the same as here, okay? So these maps here are trivial maps, but the other two maps here is what are the maps which really make k-theory interesting, okay? These are called the connecting maps. It connects for you the k-theory of the algebra on the right, this one here, C of S1 in this case, to the k-theory of the algebra on the left, okay? That one here, okay? And it connects both the k0 and k1 and k1 and k0, okay? So I will explain you how to do that, uh, these maps. Uh, they're called the exponential map and the index map in the following, but let's just give an outlook of how we can possibly apply that in our physical model, in the SSH model. Well, why could we do that? Because the Hamiltonian, well, it was basically a polynomial in, in the shifts, at least with this, without this order, okay? Well, maybe with matrices, okay, with the two by two matrices in there, but uh, this doesn't matter too much. So this thing here lies in which algebra? It lies in the continuous functions on the circle. So it lies in this algebra here. And what was interesting of this A, H, is that I could write it as a two by two matrix with two invertible operator, with one invertible operator A. And the operator A was an invertible operator, so it specifies a class in uh, the K1 group of this algebra, in the K1 of C of S1, okay? And that's a good way to, to look at the Hamiltonian because basically in physics you're not interested in just one Hamiltonian. In this business of topological materials, you're interested in classes of Hamiltonians which basically have the same properties. So for example, they have the same winding numbers. At the moment where the winding number changes, you have a phase transition, what people sometimes call a, a quantum phase transitions, but not everybody likes that terminology, okay? So if you look at classes of Hamiltonians, well, in this case here, it's equivalent to looking at classes of A's, and a class of A means that I just stay within one of the quantum phases. I don't jump to the next one, okay? Therefore, it's very natural to look at, to, to use K-theory in order to classify homotopy classes of Hamiltonians here, in this case. Anyway, our Hamiltonian gave us a K1 element down here, and uh, well, by this index map, it's going to map, be mapped into something which lies in the K0 of the, of the compact operators in this case. Well, uh, 
it turns out, what is the interesting object that we have in the compact operators? Well, one of the interesting objects that we had in the compact operators was the projection pi hat, which was the projection on the chiral boundary states. Okay? The projection onto the chiral boundary states. Well, that was the only projection that we had, and what the K-theory actually does, this interesting map, index map here does, it maps you the A, the class of A, to the class of the projection of the boundary states up here. Okay? And therefore, it establishes, this map here establishes a link between the topology, which is in the Hamiltonian H in the bulk, without any boundary conditions, with something which lives on the edge of the system, which in this case are the compact operators. Okay? In higher dimensions, it's going to be more complicated, but the same kind of strategy will actually work. Okay? So, uh, now I explained to you basically what the principle is, and we're going to do that in higher dimension, but not today. Today I want to explain to you a little bit more about K-theory, because I thought it's, uh, well, it's of general interest to learn that a little bit, because uh, K-theory has been used in several fields in physics. One is topological insulators insul in, in particular, okay? So I'll give you a half an hour lecture on what K-theory is. Maybe it takes an hour, I don't know, okay? So now we, uh, let me tell you very briefly how K-theory started and how it also is still used by a large community. It, it starts out with what people now call topological um, K-theory of vector bundles. And, uh, well, a vector bundle is what? Is you have some base space, which is a manifold. You could think of a torus or a sphere, for example. And over every point of that manifold, base manifold, you have a, a vector space. Okay? This vector space can change as you move around along the surface. But uh, basically, that... Uh, scenario gives you, defines you what, a vector bundle, okay? And there's a classic theorem called the swan sphere, sphere, swan sphere theorem, which says that any such vector bundle can be realized as the kernel of, or as the range of a projection inside of the matrix algebra of continuous functions over the manifold, okay, or the topological space X. So that's the base space. So imagine that you have a family of projections over every point. Well, you just look at the range of the projection that gives you a subspace, okay? And this subspace builds the, me the, the vector bundle. The crucial thing is, of course, that this has to be globally defined. I mean, the manifold is like a sphere, and uh, you do it over every point in a continuous way, okay? Good. Now, that means that instead of looking at vector bundles, why not look at projections over, well, projections in the matrices over continuous functions? That's a C-star algebra, okay? And what people then said, in starting in the 70s, or a little bit earlier, is they said, oh, well, instead of just studying the projections in matrices with continuous functions over uh, over a space, why not look into a general C-star algebra and study the classes of projections in the C-star algebra, okay? Good. So you replace basically C of x, the continuous functions on the space, by a non-commutative algebra, okay? A C-star algebra. So what's a C-star algebra? Well, a C-star algebra is a Banach algebra, so you can really think of it as a sub-algebra of the bounded operators on some Hilbert space. It's a subalgebra, and it, it has certain properties. It's closed. I mean, okay, first of all, it has this uh, norm, equal, uh, Banach uh, norm uh, inequality with respect to products, which you know from matrices and from operators, yeah? But it's moreover, it's, it's closed. It's closed with respect to the operator norm, okay? And the other thing, that, means, uh, that makes out a Banach algebra, okay? I didn't write out all the axioms here, but it's just a closed subalgebra of the operators of, of bounded operators on the Hilbert space. And um, it becomes a C-star algebra if moreover this C-star equation is true. 
the norm of a star a is the norm of a squared for every operator a in that algebra. Okay. Yes. So why do they require the c in the c star algebra? Because they started out with b algebras and then they went to c. No, no. I mean, why don't they work with star algebras? Because you want topological structure here. Okay. You can work just algebraically, but you see. Also from the motivation I gave you here, you, we want to do a topological theory. So I want to be able to, to work with topology. And of course you want somehow, I mean, you know, you want something closed under uh, the, uh, the topology. If it's not complete, you have a problem. It's not interesting. So therefore people, um, I mean, in many fields now use these c star algebras, okay? And any c star algebra which is commutative, is always of the type that we know. It's the continuous functions on the space, which vanish at infinity, okay? If the space has infinity, it's a locally compact space, yeah? And the function should be vanishing at, at infinity. So that's a classical theorem. And moreover, what I already told you is the second classical theorem, also Gelfand, Neymark, and Siegel, tells you that uh, you can always see a C-star algebra in an adequate representation as the sub-algebra of operators on the bounded Hilbert space, okay, roughly. And we already had examples. Well, the simplest example is that you just have this complex numbers with the multiplicative structure of complex numbers or the matrices with the matrix product, okay, and the linear structure associated, all satisfies this, yeah. And uh, we had also, well, the continuous functions. We had the triplets algebra before. Uh, here's another interesting exact sequence that we'll use a little bit. It's the Kalkin exact sequence. So you have the bounded operators on the Hilbert space, which as in Fritz talk is denoted by this B of H here, contains the compact operators, which were the norm limits of the finite dimensional matrices, yeah, and uh, which are con included there. And then you can project down onto a quotient. And the quotient is called a Kalkin algebra. Okay? That's uh, also an, an interesting algebra, which also produces the, uh, an interesting exact sequence of algebras. The K-theory is not so interesting in there, okay? But maybe I'll say something more on that later. So here's the definition of K0 now, a bit more formal. Before, I told you, you just look at projections, but instead of projections, what is more, if you want a rigorous, nice definition on which fits on one slide, I'm done here, yeah? Uh, Instead of working with the projection, you go and work with operators which are symmetries. You take 2p minus 1. What means symmetry? That means that this operator here is an adjoint, is, is a self-adjoint operator. It has spectrum just 1 and minus 1, and therefore it squares to the identity. Okay? So that's what one calls them, a symmetry. Uh, and in, instead of, I mean, from every symmetry, of course, I can get back a projection, which is the projection on, in this case, the way that I wrote it here, and the projection onto the positive subspace, yeah? Uh, so this is completely equivalent whether I work with projection or with symmetries. And it's easier to define the group with symmetries, okay? Um, so one thing that in K-theory you can't avoid is that you add units. Why? Well, it's, it's really a crucial point. It's really tedious, but it's a crucial point. You can't avoid it. Adding units means that if your algebra doesn't have the identity operator in it, you should uh, somehow add it. You can't avoid it. And in any exact sequence, there are always operators, and uh, there are always algebras which don't have units. For example, up here, the compact operators, they don't have unit. The identity is not a compact operator, okay? Nevertheless, I want to be able to define the K-theory, and therefore I need the unit somehow. Because how can I define a unitary in an, operate, in an algebra which doesn't have a unit? I can't even write the equation u star u equal to 1. 1 is not in the algebra, so it doesn't make any sense, okay? So you need the unit, and you can't avoid it, okay? So it's a bit of a tedious point, but it's a standard point by now. The standard point means that you just make your algebra slightly larger. You add, well, you add the unit. The unit is just one direction. It's a complex numbers, which complex number times one, it's um, the identity, it's just a complex number. You just add it, and then 
when edited, well, I, I get a new thing, A+, plus, which should be, again, a C-star algebra. So what should one do? Well, I should uh, define first uh, the algebraic structure. So you need now to take products of A, comma, T and with B, comma, S. Okay? Or well, direct sum of those. And the way that you do it is you, you just think of uh, writing A plus T uh, times A plus B and just think of the thing being the identity. What do you get? You get just T times S, which is the product. It's the new complex number on the right-hand side. But then there are these mixed terms, S times A and T times B. Those you can define because S and T are complex numbers and you do have a linear structure on the algebra. Okay, so T times A, for example, something which makes sense or T times B. Okay, and you can define this thing here as a linear sum of matrices or operators in this case. And the adjoint, well, the adjoint is the adjoint of that and then the complex conjugate of the number. Okay, so this is the algebraic structure and then you need to define a norm. Well, the norm is you take like every when you want to make a C-star norm on the continuous functions, there's not many choices. You have to use the maximum norm, okay? The maximum norm means here that you take the supremum of the norm of A and of the norm of T, which is just the absolute value of T, okay? Then you have to check, it's not completely trivial, that that really is a C-star norm, okay? But you can do that. And the new algebra, well, it was constructed to have a unit, and the unit is 0, 1. You see, with this product rule up here, if I put b equal to zero, you see any a t is mapped to a t again. Yeah? So it is a new unit. The new algebra has the unit, and we can now use it. Okay. Uh, before using it, there's something that one needs to do, namely extract the scalar part. So um, we've done a simple construction, but even this simple construction already leads to an exact sequence. Okay, very simple exact sequence, but it's again an exact sequence of C-star algebras. The algebra A is embedded in A plus, the unitization, unitization, okay? It's included. It just map A, A to A comma zero. It's in there, okay? And uh, on the other hand side, I can project and extract the uh, integer, uh, the, the scalar part by just uh, throwing away the first part, okay? So AT is mapped to T, a complex number, and these two maps, they define you an exact sequence, okay? Namely, if you map, I mean the range, the range of the inclusion is equal to the kernel of that map, you see immediately, yeah? That's an exact sequence. Okay. So uh, now rho has an inverse. I can also map, so that means this exact sequence here is actually uh, a split sequence. This rho here is included, has an inverse map. You just map t to zero t. And it's also an algebraic map, okay? And therefore, going from A plus, first projecting down and then going back, induces a map which is called the scalar part. It's called S here. Okay, so you first go down, you throw away the i, a, and then you go back. So it's basically neglecting setting t equal to zero. You have a comma t, which is mapped to t. Looks trivial, but okay, it's useful. Once you've done that, you know how to extract the scalar part. We can now define uh, already the, the k group. So what I told you is we work with, instead of working with projections, we work with these symmetries. So it's a symmetry which is of arbitrary matrix degree of freedom, can be the matrix size of entries can be arbitrary large, but it has to be pair even, yeah, even. I only have even sized matrices here. So here, this is the symmetries equations that we had over there. And then you ask that the scalar part, the scalar part of V is homotropic to the matrix E to N, and E to N is just this matrix here. E to N is the trivial element. It's 1N minus 1N. And it should, the scalar part should be not equal to this matrix, but it should be deformable into that matrix. Okay? Well, it's a bit technical, but this works beautifully. Why? Uh, because now on this set of symmetries, you define an equivalence relation. By homotopy, 
Okay, so two objects, two symmetries are equivalent if I can deform them into each other. But there's something else that you need to do. You need to be able to identify matrices of a given size with matrices of larger size. Okay? Because, for example, if you have a projection of rank 1 in an n-dimensional space or in an n by plus plus 1 dimensional space, you somehow want to be able to identify them. Okay? Because this is stable theory stable in the sense that if you get larger and larger matrices, it should give you the same result. At least this I should be able to, to do. Okay? Okay, so how do you do that? Well, uh, this is the second part of the equivalence relation, so homotopy, equivalence, um, and you identify V also with V tensor, this trivial block here. Okay? So you say that for any V, of this type, which is a given matrix, you identify that with V E2 or more general E2N. They're the same, okay? So the classes are the same. So that allows you to identify objects of a given size with objects of larger size. And then all you do is you take the quotient of the symmet class of symmetries with respect to this equivalence relation. And that is the K group, okay? And it's an abelian group. Why? Because if you have two, what is the abelian structure? If you have two classes, V and V prime, well, you just go ahead and you take what people call a Whitney sum, you put them into two by two matrices, and you see all these things, they still remain true. So I just have a, a bigger object, but it's, it's okay. Defines me a sum. What's the inverse? Well, the inverse in this formulation is very simple. The inverse of V is simply the class of minus V. No problem. Okay? And you check that's really an abelian group. There's not much more to say. I mean, it's, it's trivial to check it now, believe me. So that defines the K0 group, not in the standard way that people maybe do it. You see, I didn't do any Groton deconstruction here, which makes things might sometimes a bit complicated. The price that I pay is that I don't work projections, but I work with these uh, symmetries. But in some, si some sense, this, I think it's easier like that. Well, you can, the minus and the plus signs can be where uh, as long as you have n minus signs and n plus signs. Yes. Yes, that is uh, the same. You see, I mean, you can write down a two by two matrix. What he says is that uh, is if I write one, two, and minus one, two as one matrix, okay, and I write uh, one, minus one, one, minus one, for example, yeah, this is exactly the same class. You can deform one into the other. All you do is you do a rotation in the middle on the two by two block. You rotate it, yeah? No big deal. They're the same. Homotopy equivalent. Yes. Okay, so this is the first group. And let's give some examples or some comments. What I said is you can check that instead of working with the these, you can work with classes of projections. And then the thing looks like this. Any element can be identified with the class of the projection of P, which is the negative uh, which is the positive spectral subspace of, of V minus the scalar part. But you have to subtract that scalar part, okay? That's a price to pay. That's a way that you also find it in some books. And, uh, well, what are the basic properties? Basic properties is already by construction that if you go to matrices, you take a larger algebra by taking matrices of that uh, algebra, you get the same thing. I mean, this is intrinsic in the construction. In the construction, already we allowed to go to larger and larger matrices, okay? And uh, the other thing is that uh, you can push the matrices to compact operators and doesn't change the K groups. So it's compactly stable, one says. Tensorizing with compact operators doesn't change K theory. At least K0, but for K1 it's the same. So, uh, well, some examples. We already did the first one. Complex numbers and matrices and compact operators. The K group of the bounded operators is not very interesting. Why? Uh, because it's trivial. Um, it's not a trivial fact that it's, the K theory is, non, is, is really trivial. It tells you that any projection can be deformed over separable Hilbert space into any other projection. 
Okay? It's not a trivial fact, but it's true. It's actually, okay, there's, there's a reference. There are two standard books uh, where you, if you want to learn these things by, by, with details, there's one called by Rordan and co-authors, and another by Weg and Olson. Okay, on the slides I, at the end I have I have references. Okay. Okay, uh, k zero of the continuous functions on the circle is z. You say, wow, there's something interesting there. But if you think a bit, it's not so interesting. All that this does, this z in the continuous function. Now we look at projections over the continuous functions. Yeah. All that the, you can do is you can add matrix degrees of freedom, okay? So your continuous function with a matrix degree of freedom can have a certain rank, the projection. That rank is simply the Z here. So the Z here just comes from the identity, uh, from, from adding the matrix degrees of freedom of the projection, okay? Triplets algebra also has a Z. Okay, let's stop this last, this last thing there and we leave it out. Let's go to K1. Well, K1, we're, we're now a bit routine already. We, we did this construction once. Here you do basically the same thing. Instead of using symmetries, we use unitaries. Also, in arbitrary, of arbitrary large size. Size doesn't have to be even dimensional now. But, uh, okay, you, you have arbitrary size, unitary, okay? Equivalence relation, as before, by homotopy. And the other thing is uh, you want to be able to identify one unitary with the unitary of larger size. Well, you just add a trivial identity here. And you can do that because the identity is in there, in A+. Plus. Okay? Then the K group is just defined again as the quotient of this thing here by the relation, and the addition is given by Whitney sum, just like we did B over there. Okay? You just write them in, in matrix size of doubled, doubled size. Okay? And, uh, okay, let's look at some examples. There's no trivial K, there's no non-trivial K1 element in the complex numbers and in the, um, and in the uh, matrices because any unitary can be deformed in another unitary. The unitary group is connected, okay? That's even true in infinite dimension on a Hilbert space. The unitary group on an infinite dimension Hilbert space is connected. Therefore, for the bounded operators also, you have this fact, but then it's a non-trivial fact. It's really non-trivial. It's what people call Kuiper's theorem, okay, from the 50s. So for the bounded operators, no interest in K1 either. Uh, well, uh, one interesting K1 group we already met, namely the K1 group on the con of the continuous functions on the circle. Why? Because there were the unitaries were all these maps which have windings, yeah? And I can't deform them into each other, so these are really different classes, okay? Yes? Whether you need the signature in the case, K0 and in the case, K1. The signature? Uh, well, it's the, why, why I do this even case? Yeah. Because basically doing this doubling here avoids me uh, to do the Gürtel deconstruction, okay? So because in some sense, in my symmetry, I have P and one minus P in there, okay? And therefore, I don't need that extra strap. Makes the construction easier, okay? And it's completely equivalent to the standard pr way to proceed. And you don't need that for the unitary group. You can do it for the unitary, I mean, you can do it for this as well. Another way to build up K1 is to say I take all symmetries as before, but I impose moreover a chiral symmetry, supplementary symmetry. Then I do work in even dimensions in order to be able to implement the chiral symmetry and look at objects and homotopy classes only which, with respect to the supplementary symmetry, which is the chiral symmetry. And then you're back into that picture, okay? Then the K1 appears as a subgroup of K0 in the construction, yeah? with the limited homotopy, of course. Okay. Now let's get to the interesting things in K-theory. Now we have the definitions, and what I told you is what is really interesting in K-theory is that for an exact sequence of, K, uh, of C star algebras, you can connect these K-groups, okay? And it really gives you non-trivial things, 
Hopefully I can convince you. And there are two things which we need. Well, there's the suspension and the bot map. Well, the suspension of any C star algebra is just this C star algebra. You look at paths, continuous paths inside of the algebra, but which vanish at the endpoints. So you can either just tensorize with the C0 functions, continuous functions which vanish infinity, or you can take the functions on an interval, but you ask the, to n to um, be zero at the boundary, having limits at the boundary which are equal to zero. Okay? So that's the suspension construction. In C star algebra, for me, those of you who have had topology, it's completely equivalent to, to the suspension construction in, in uh, topology. Okay? And so, of course, the suspension also has K groups, but the good thing is that the suspension gives you basically the same K groups. Namely, if I take the suspension of an algebra, this, this algebra here, and take its K0 group, it's naturally identified with the K1 group. So you can identify paths of, um, you can identify classes of projections in the suspension with classes of unitaries in the algebra. So I'm going to write you the formula. The formula can be written in several ways. It's relatively explicit, but one way which mathematicians, mathematical physics likes is basically that you, you can see this as the solution of an adiabatic time evolution. Okay? I would need maybe 10 minutes to explain that, but you, the adi adiabatic time evolution gives you a very explicit formula for this theta. Let's look at the bot map. That's the second important map in the whole business. It, it gives you another isomorphism. Another isomorphism, this time from K0 of the algebra, here K1 of the algebra is involved, and it goes into the um, K1 group of the suspension. So again, it connects the K theory of the suspension to the algebra, but it's the other thing. We have two, two maps there, okay? The first one was this suspension map, the other is called the bot map. Here's a way to write it. Instead of working with these Vs, let me work with the projections. The projection, you want to build out of a projection a path in the suspension. There are not many ways to do it. Try and sit down and write a formula. This is basically the only formula that you can come up with. It's 1 minus P plus P, and on the range of P you do one rotation by just multiplying with a face. And that's already non-trivial, okay? It gives you something non-trivial. And it's really, the right-hand side is really a projection, uh, is really a unitary, sorry. Uh, it's a unitary inside of uh, the suspension. It's obviously a path, or, I mean, there's the time, it's the real number that you have here, uh, chosen such that here it varies between zero and one, and it is for each T, you have here a unitary operator, right? because it's just a projection, and on the range of the projection, you just multiply with the unitary number, I mean a unit number. Well, the deep fact is that this map, written out like that, really is an isomorphism between these two groups. It's an isomorphism. Not trivial at all. Okay, and then you can combine these two things here. You go from... Uh, K0 of A to K1 of S of A, and then you go from K1 of S of A to K0 of S of S of A. And then you get what people call bot periodicity, tells you that K0 of double suspension apply twice this tensorizing with C0 of R, uh, gives you back the K0 of A. So it's periodic. So the K theory is a two-periodic theory. Therefore, you only have two groups, K0 and K1. Huh? So you can do more general, yeah? You can do, define higher K groups like you would do in topology, but basically you don't get anything new. Therefore, people can restrict themselves to just starting two groups, okay? So let's try and see, uh, I said I'll skip this. Uh, Let's try and see how we can use these maps and get the interesting exact sequence. So, um, as I told you, uh, you always start out with an exact sequence of C star algebras. I here wrote it with K for the ideal, okay? 
you can think of the compact operators here. There's some algebra and then there's some quotient and I have such an exact sequence. For any such exact sequence of C-star algebras, what I tell you now is correct, okay? I already told you there are two very simple maps, which are the inclusion push forward and projection push forward maps, which uh, connect you K0, well, the K0 groups uh, associated to the push forwards here, okay? So this is natural maps. There's nothing really to do. You just write down the formulas. Of course, afterwards you have to check that it's true what I say, namely that this gives you an exact sequence of abelian groups. You have to check that I lower star has a range which is exactly equal to the kernel of pi star, and that requires some technical work, okay? A little bit, not too much, but you have to do it, okay? Once you've done that, you've done the simple thing, the simple parts of the exact sequence, uh, now there are these two connecting maps, the flash which goes down there and one which goes up here, which make the whole thing really interesting, okay? So what are these connecting maps? Let me first define them uh, by just writing down a formula. So there's one which goes from K0 of the quotient to K0 of the ideal. So we're talking about this guy here, okay? That's called the exponential map. Why? Because you can simply write it out using the exponential. Okay, exponential function. So um, we have V, which dis defines a class. It's a class in the K0 group, so li like we had up here. So I can identify this V with a projection also by this formula here. And uh, what you do now is you look for uh, a lift. Well, what does that mean, looking for a lift? Well, that's something important. So we have here K, we have A in the middle, and then we have the quotient here, we have this X sequence here. So now we have here uh, a V, which is an operator in there, or in matrix algebras over that. And you need to know that, because this is exact, you know, need to know that this V is always the image of something. There are many points which are pre-images, but we choose one, okay? So you choose one operator B, you say it's a lift of V, which has the property that pi of B is equal to V. That's a lift. And you choose this lift in such a way that it's a contraction. You can do that. It's a little bit of work. If V is, unit, is unitary, as we had here, you can lift it to an operator without increasing the norm. Okay, you have to check that that's possible. It is possible, okay? And then, well, you use that lift. I called it B here. You take B plus one, divide by two. Actually, this one half B plus one is nothing by, but a lift of P. So P is also over in here, and P also has a lift, and it's, well, of one half uh, B plus one is being projected down to pi, P. Okay, so you have the lift of the projection here and you take e to the power two pi i of that. Well, that by construction, because b was self-adjoined, yeah, I didn't say, but it is written here, self-adjoined lift. You have e to the power two pi i times a self-adjoined operator. That's definitely a unitary operator, so it defines me a K1 class. What's not trivial is that the K1 class is really lying in the algebra on the left-hand side. Why? Because B was in A, the algebra A, yeah? And uh, so I would think that this thing here is functional calculus in the algebra A, but in fact, it's true that it's in the subset of the ideal, okay? That makes it interesting. You can see that, in the, you can write that in various forms, okay? This formula, instead of using exponential, you can write with cosines and sines, you can also write it like this. All these ways of formulating is equivalent. Let's just take that as a definition and take the definition of the second map, index map, now on the other side of the diagram, yeah, going from K1 up here to K0. Yes? Well, how did you do it in a way that they respect the group? Um, that this is in... Uh, 
so the group property is relatively easy because what you do is you, I mean, if, if you have P and P prime, basically you just have them diagonally. Okay, so the image, if, if, if I take the exponential map of this guy here, yeah, of this class, you lose lift, lifts for this and for this, gives you two B and B prime of matrices and gives you the, the Whitney sum of two uh, exponential maps. So the group property is easy to, to verify that it respects that. What is much, much more difficult is that it's really uh, makes this whole diagram exact. The exactness is the thing which is difficult to check. Okay? Good. So now we go from K1 of the quotient to K0 of the compacts. And there, well, here's a formula. Okay, you start out, now you have a unitary, uh, a unitary over here in this algebra here. Yeah, there's a unitary in there. You take that unitary, it has to have a lift. Well, the lift, I call it B. I choose the lift again to be a contraction. And with this uh, lift, well, you build this matrix here. 2B, B star minus one, and then you, you see the formula. Okay, it's some formula. Why is that thing called index map? Well, because if you specify to the case of the Kalkin algebra, this thing here is precisely the index of a Fretholm operator, okay? So I was going to explain that to you here on one slide, but I think I'll skip it. For those who are really interested to see the connection, uh, there's a short slide that you can look at, okay? How, how to do that. But the, the, the fact is, is, it's easy to write out this map again, yeah? as it's easy to write out that map and to use that. And what is deep is this theorem then, okay, which goes back to, the, to Atiyah and, uh, and Kairubi and so on, people in, worked in the early 70s, um, which, which says that these two definitions really make this diagram here an exact sequence of uh, a billion groups closed into each other, okay? A six-term exact sequence, one says. So um, one of the applications we already saw, we used the triplets extension, which we used in our one-dimensional model. And uh, in this one-dimensional model, well, we had the exact sequence. I wrote it here again. The compact operators, triplets algebra, continuous functions. We had a function which had a winding here, the index map. What is the index map? Well, you write it out, the definition that I had there. You write it out, it gives you exactly the projection on the boundary states, which is a projection. It's a compact projection. It's of finite rank, okay? That's the way that we want to use it. But I want to maybe, because I can't really do that much more today anyway, so I want to give you some more details and about K-theory so that you might feel more comfortable with it, okay? Uh, and uh, also show you what the non-trivial elements are, the non-trivial projections that one usually deals with. And this can be understood basically also with, uh, with classical topological theory. So in classical uh, theory of spaces, yeah, topology of spaces, you look at an exact sequence of, of spaces. Um, we have here the D-sphere, okay, this D-sphere, which is the surface of a D plus one ball filled, yeah? And inside of that ball lies, well, the ball not, not filled with, without the boundary. The boundary is exactly what sits on the surface, okay? Well, that's an exact sequence of uh, sets now, okay? And it leads directly to an exact sequence of C star algebras by looking at the continuous functions, okay? Well, uh, continuous functions on this filled ball can actually be identified with the continuous functions on Rd plus one. Why? Because if you have the functions which vanish on the ball, on the surface of the ball, you can etail the functions to outside and gives you a function on the full space. Topologically, it's exactly the same, okay? And uh, well, then you have in the middle the largest algebra, which are the continuous functions. I don't have to put a zero because this thing, the closed disk, disk here does not have a boundary, yeah? I mean, it, sorry, it has a boundary, but it has no points at infinity. Uh, so I don't need C0 here, and then the continuous functions on the sphere. So this is the exact sequence that you get. 
And uh, the groups of uh, the K groups of this exact sequence are very well known. This is basically the Fields Medal of, of Bott who calculated the uh, K theory of the sphere or the homotopic theory of, of the spheres. Okay, so here are the, the answer. There's a, there's a distinction between even and odd case. So for the odd case, uh, the groups exactly written as in the K theory exact sequence as before uh, are these, okay, you have here Z, 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 and then there's two zeros, okay, and in the even case, well, you have Z, Z2, Z here. And I, I would like to explain you uh, one of these maps, one of these maps which is interesting, um, namely the index map, going from an odd dimensional sphere to an even dimensional disk, okay, and this means that we go here, we go for an odd dimensional sphere, so the K group, uh, K, so, so um, a unitary element in the C star algebra on an odd dimensional sphere, okay? And we try to look at something which is, well, a projection or a symmetry in an even dimensional disk or on an even dimensional space. Okay, if you understand this, what I tell you now, you somehow going to understand the real heart of K-theory, okay? Because what this leads to, looking at this map, leads to the so-called bot element, which is a, a non-trivial projection. Okay, and to make things even easier, let's take the even dimensional, uh, the odd dimensional uh, sphere to be the one dimensional sphere. One is odd, so that's perfect. And uh, there we already know what the non-trivial elements of K1 are. It's just functions which have a winding, okay? So the generator, I denote it by Z, but I view Z now as the function on the complex plane, from the complex plane to the complex plane. Um, if you can, I mean, you can restrict it to the function which maps the circle into the circle, yeah? So here Z is really viewed as, as the identity map on, on, on C, yeah? And uh, it maps C to C, but it also maps the circle onto the circle, and this map here has a winding, if I view it like that, which is equal to one, okay? So how did we calculate the index map of that? Well, we needed to construct a lift. What means a lift? Well, instead of viewing this function as a function on the circle, I'm going to view it as a function from the closed ball. Uh, so all of a sudden then, this Z becomes also a map from the closed ball to the closed ball. Now that thing here was invertible. It was unitary. Okay? This thing here is not invertible anymore, but it's only a lift. I didn't say that the lift has to be invertible. And in interesting case, it never is invertible, okay? But I can use that lift. Uh, why did I have D1 here? I think maybe, is it D1 or D2? How does I... The way that I wrote it here, it should be D2, yeah? Okay. Um, so it's not... It's, it's not invertible, but it's still a contraction, yeah? Well, it doesn't contract at all, but it's still a contraction. And um, what is the bottom element now? Well, it's just the image of this thing. So you just write out the formula that I had before with the Zs. Yeah, this was the definition of the index map, where you here, you see you had just to put in uh, the lift. Well, if the lift is the function Z, you have two Z times Z star, which is Z absolute value, minus one. Okay, and so on. So, uh, two Z minus one, and, and well, you fill out the other ideas. So what is written here on the right-hand side is a continuous function on the two disk, and it really vanishes at the boundaries, okay? Uh, if Z goes to one, this thing here is the identity. Identity minus identity, okay? So there's nothing interesting out on the surface. It's really a function which lives in the ideal, unitalized, okay? 
And, um, well, this, this function here is a projection. You see, if you take this matrix, for every z, it's a, fun it's, uh, it's a two by two matrix. Do the calculation once to check that that's really a projection. You square the matrix. I mean, you, it's obviously self-adjoint, yeah, because there's z and there's z bar here. But uh, you have to check that the square of this thing is really, again, again the matrix itself. Okay, it's a simple thing, but you check it. That thing here is called the bot element. It's the only non it's the only non-trivial representative of the non-trivial K theory in uh, on on the uh, open disk or equivalently on R two. Yes. No, it's not obvious, but it's uh, okay. For different lifts, you get different representatives. You can deform them into each other, okay? But it's again something that you have to check that all these definition of the exponential map and the index map, which in did involve both a lift, that definition is independent of the choice of the lift. It's a non-trivial fact. It's not completely obvious, but it's also not extremely hard, okay? Okay, good. So. How do you go to higher dimensions? Well, you, instead of working now with uh, higher dimensions means now I have D odd large, you want a unitary matrix over an odd dimensional sphere. And uh, we work again with these points on the sphere here. So let them be called X1 up to XD plus one here, yeah? D is even. You use gamma matrices. So this you know from your physics class maybe, or you know Clifford algebras. You use the gamma matrices, which are the generators of the Clifford algebra. And you take X, Xj times gamma j plus I times Xd. So the I is the supplementary I that you add here. Okay, it's a complex number. And uh, this thing here is really unitary, you can check it. And the image of this unitary, well, is basically given by the same formula. It's the same formula as the index map before. It's, it's this thing here, okay? And that is a non-trivial element. It's a non-trivial projection on the uh, even-dimensional sphere. And it's the only one there is because this group is just Z, okay? Now, this is, was classical topology. And just to give an outlook, you go on afterwards, you're interested in doing in particular in our applications, we do quantum mechanics. You want to do that in non commutative algebras. But there's something called fuzzy spheres. So where all these pro formulas that I wrote down there can be completely generalized. So you, instead of, what, what does it mean now to quantize the coordinates? Well, the x1 until xd, which were the real numbers that I had, yeah, defining the parameterization of my sphere, I'm going to replace them by self-adjoint operators, okay? Now somehow I have then D self-adjoint operators, X1 up to, e, or D plus one here, yeah? They're self-adjoint operators, but I somehow still want them to be a sphere, at least approximately. So what do you do? Well, you ask that the sum of the squares of these guys here uh, is almost one up to a small arrow. And you ask that also, the coordinates, they approximately commute, okay? So if they would be just numbers, I mean, they would commute. X1 and X2 would be equal to X2, X1. But we know for matrices, self-joint matrices is not true anymore. So you ask all the commutators to be small. So having small commutators and having this is an object that I call a fuzzy sphere of dimension D and of width delta, so to say. And each such fuzzy sphere leads to, if the sphere is odd dimensional, leads to a non-trivial K1 class by the same formula as before, okay? And moreover, if I have an exact sequence of algebras, say this thing here is in the algebra A, specifies a K1 class in A, I can uh, const look at the index map of that it gives me a non-trivial element in the K0 class of um, the quotient, okay? Same formula. 
Now that you can work with. It gives you interesting consequences. Okay. Well, you have any questions on on K theory? So you think about it a little bit. I know this was a crash course for some of you. Others have heard all of this ten times, but. Uh, uh, well, let me give you a glimpse in the last five minutes of how we will use that. Okay? Very short glimpse. Uh, I have to look here. Ba, 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 ba. So this is uh, what I'll explain you tomorrow. I want to get to the bulk boundary correspondence here. So how, how are we going to use that in our physics systems? Well, we generalize what we did in one dimension. We had our systems which were in D dimensions, yeah, without a boundary. In this D dimensional space, we have operators which describe our physics and which are the observable algebras, which hopefully can contain some interesting topology, so some K0 groups and K1 groups, which are non-trivial. Okay? And um, well, they describe the bulk of these systems. And now we restrict these systems to half spaces because what I told you is that in topological insulators, the interesting thing happens on the boundaries. Okay? So I should restrict the operators to a half space so that I have a boundary. Okay? Restricting to half spaces is like in the triplets extension that we did before. We change one of the isometries, which was a shift, to a partial isometry. We don't do much more than that. Okay? But it's a crucial difference. You do that. You add something. The algebra becomes larger. You get what one calls the triplets extension, which contains half space operators now. Okay? Inside of these half space operators are all the operators which are at the boundary. This is subalgebra. Okay? And with this subalgebra, well, you can do things in particular if you want to look at observables in your quantum system, which live at the boundaries of these systems, they should be lying in this subalgebra. The subalgebra hopefully also has some interesting topology, and what the K theory does for you is it connects you the interesting, I mean, the K groups of the bulk to the K groups of the boundary. And it really connects your physical quantities. So you write out the exact sequence, yeah? And the two connecting maps are precisely the two maps that we had before, the exponential map and the index map in general, and you have to write them out more explicitly now. Yeah. So more explicitly, in which sense? Well, in the fermionic system, you start out with a projection. The projection defines your K0 class, and then you should look at the exponential map of that and calculate it, okay? On the other hand side, if you have a physical system uh, which has a chiral symmetry, then I know that the Fermi projection can be reduced out to an off-diagonal element. It gives me a K1 class, and the K1 class specifying my Fermi projection of a chiral system gives me a K1 class, and I should be able to calculate what happens on the boundary of such a system. Okay, that's what we want to do tomorrow. And uh, I'll try to explain to you that, okay, you do actually, uh, well, these, these maps really do in these applications, like in the 1D case, lead to interesting new situations which um, are relevant to the understanding of a topological insulator. Okay. Any more? Well, there were basically no questions, but uh, do you have any questions or comments? Well, uh, I guess it's time for the coffee break. Ah, there is one. Well, okay, he doesn't want to cough the coffee yet. Si, déjame ir al final. Mira. I suggest these two books if you want to learn about K theory from scratch. Okay? These two books. RLL, you don't know the slides, you don't have to take notes, okay? You find these books uh, on any server. And uh, basically, what I'm going to tell you in detail, uh, well, what I did tell you up to now, and which I'm going to tell you also in the lecture tomorrow, 
is also written in this book, which you can also download on the web, okay? Okay. La, la otra, esta? Ándale. Uh -huh. <laughs>